Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. My name is Karen. We are really thrilled that you're joining us today to find out more about the Oxford Summer Abroad Program. Before we begin, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people and from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So we do have a pretty jam-packed schedule today. And uh, we, in short, we're going to be talking, I'm going to be providing some introduction. We are very fortunate to have our instructors as well as some summer abroad staff, as well as a student speaker that will be joining us today. I will be providing an overview of summer abroad. Following that, we're very fortunate to have our professors join us to speak individually more about their courses, their field trips, to answer any questions that you may have. Following that, I will describe more about the program details. We will hear from a student, a former student participant of the Oxford program to describe more of her experiences, costs, application process, next steps, as well as question and answer. Please note that this is a webinar, meaning that you can't necessarily chat with us, but you could um, ask us questions, and this is the time to do so. Our professors are here, and we also have uh, some of broad staff on the back end that will be helping us. So this is a time to ask questions. Please use the Q&A function uh, to uh, ask any questions that you may have during the session. Uh, and also please note that this webinar will be recorded. So this will be shared with students who have missed this session and it will be shared with you as well with other students who are interested in the next few days. So in terms of introductions, uh, we're very fortunate to have our instructors and we'll be meeting them in a few minutes. We have Professor William Watson, who's teaching the Criminology course, Professor Cass Banning, who's teaching the Cinema Studies course, Professors Nazanin Kazra and Professor Abdullah Farhoudi, who will be teaching uh, for the second year our economics course. Professor Liza Blake, we're very fortunate uh, to be teaching an English course. And last but not least, we have Professor Stuart Kamnetsky, who will be teaching once again a psychology course in Oxford. Joining us from the Summer Abroad office, of course, my name is Karen, and I'm the program manager. In the back end, we have my fantastic colleagues, Wendy, Joe, as well as our director, Lorraine. They will be answering your questions in the back end. And it's great that we have Alicia Sanudo, who will be joining us and speaking about her experiences from 2022 taking an English course in Oxford. In terms of summer abroad, I'm sure that most of you have heard of summer abroad already, but just to give you a refresher, uh, we are celebrating our 52nd year anniversary this year. We've been around for a long, long time. Our model of study abroad has been very successful for a certain reason. Our model of having a short-term course uh, study abroad and having the opportunity for students to gain a full year credit in just a few weeks has really attracted many students throughout the years. It's a chance for you to earn a full year arts and science credit, not a transfer credit in three to four weeks. So this is a very seamless process. You complete the program and you complete the course. It, it is folded into your CGPA as well as your transcripts. So it does not involve any transfer credits like in an exchange program. This year, we're offering destinations from across the world in over 15 destinations, including Oxford. Our programs are, are mostly taught by U of T faculty and international faculty. In Oxford's case, it is taught by completely U of T faculty. Students do take our programs for many reasons. Uh, some of them is to fill program, breadth, or distribution requirements. And because of that, students in your courses won't necessarily be the same type of students that you'll see in on Toronto campuses. So you'll meet students from different years, from different programs, from different campuses. And this is great. So it's an opportunity for you to meet other students from other uh, places, other faculties um, in a small classroom environment. So this is small class sizes in Oxford, I would like to say that most of our courses are ranges between 25 to 30 students. And because of that, you really get to know your fellow classmates, but you also get to know your professors as well. This is a great opportunity to take field trips, you know, regular courses, and really get to know uh, your fellow classmates and professors. It's a great opportunity just in case you're interested in pursuing post-graduate school. This is time to really get to know your professors and get to know your research 
subjects uh, even more while you are abroad. This is just time to have an all-inclusive study option. So a lot of the details that you usually worry about when you travel, the logistics, accommodations, our office really provides. We provide the support for you before um, your trip and especially when you are abroad. You have access to on-site non-academic support. So we have hired an on-site staff that will be living in residence in Oxford or it's specifically in Worcester College. College. And they're in charge of holding orientation sessions, making sure that your stay is a comfortable one. But most importantly, they're there for emergencies. If you need to contact somebody any time of the day, um, if you are in state of emergency, you're sick, etc., you depend on the on-site staff to help you out. And our office um, hosts pre-departure orientations. So we do take you through the logistics, safety requirements. Uh, we make sure that you're well prepared before your trip. And our office also has a very close relationship with Safety Abroad Office at U of T. So if there are any um, cases of emergencies, we use the reliable resources in U of T as well as Safety Abroad to help you through your way. Professional developments, you start building your network. Lots of students do take this opportunity as advantage to build their networks for post-secondary as well as professional studies. Um, you explore possibility for graduate school. You gain practical hands-on skills. So this small classroom environment really does help you with your research skills as well as um, makes you a bit more knowledgeable in terms of your research uh, areas that you are studying. And of course, you gain an international experience, a recognition as well as appreciation of a different culture. You make personal development, so you make lifelong friends. Believe me, after this trip, uh, be, after this experience, it just doesn't end on August 31st. Beyond that, you will make uh, really close friends through people that you live close to on residence and also the fellow classmates that you meet uh, throughout your trips and field trips uh, at your course. You gain independence, you gain confidence, you could become more adaptable and overcoming problems, and you gain communication and presentation skills as well. A lot of our courses are not just peer lecturers. You are there um, out there on the field during field trips. And a lot of our um, courses are seminar-based, group work-based as well. So you get to gain more uh, great communication skills uh, during this experience. And finally, you immerse yourself. You have a full wide course condensed in four weeks. So you're totally immersed into that subject matter. The subject matter of these field trips are really curated by your professors. So this is a great opportunity for you to really be immersed in the subject matter and not just learn about it, but really go in the field, go to different cities, go to different venues, hear from guest speakers and really be immersed in the subject matter. You focus only on one course, so you are immersed in that way as well. Content is fresh and top of mind. Your location becomes a living textbook. And lastly, your field trips connect what you learn in the classroom to real life setting. In terms of eligibility, U of T students must be in good academic standing. So for you to be eligible to apply, you have to meet the prerequisite courses. You also can't be on probation as well. So for you to submit in an application, this won't necessarily get you into the course, but this will make you eligible to apply. If you have completed one or more courses, you must have a CGPA of at least 1.75 at the time of application. And first year students with no final grades can apply to certain courses. So courses such as criminology that have no prerequisites, you're more than welcome to apply. U of T students in a professional faculty or graduate program, U of T alumni or non-degree students are welcome to apply to our courses as well. And this is for all courses within summer abroad. But please note that current undergraduate U of T students do take priority. And lastly, students from other North American universities can also apply to our programs as a visiting visiting students, but they require a letter of permission from their host institution. So before we get to our courses, I would like to invite Professor William Watson to say just a few words about Oxford, UK. Okay, so thanks. And thanks, Karen, for the introduction. And I'm just going to um, very briefly before I talk about my course, let me just say that in terms of Oxford, you're going to be in a very beautiful city. Certainly parts of it are very beautiful, the parts where we are, uh, a very, very beautiful college environment. And, and you, you'll see pictures on 
on the screen at times, uh, which gives some indication of, of what a lovely place it is to live and work. But actually, they don't really do it justice. It's a very unusually beautiful place to work. I've always found myself able to do a surprising amount of work, even though I'm very busy, just because it's such a delightful environment to relax in, to work in. And of course, we're very close to London and it's very easy to travel to London and a crucial part of the whole summer abroad experience. And I don't know if any of you have done summer abroad elsewhere, for instance, in the past. But uh, we really want you to take advantage of the opportunities to travel, uh, to look around Oxford, of course, and to places near there, such as Bath, um, but also to get to London and to travel much further afield as well. Um, you're very, very close by Canadian standards at any rate to mainland Europe, to Scotland and Edinburgh. Uh, so students have a wonderful opportunity to travel and to enjoy Oxford and to enjoy Europe, in fact. But I think I want to emphasize something that Karen really introduced which is that I think many people will love those travel experiences. They'll love being in Oxford. But actually, summer abroad is a rather more special experience than that suggests. There's something about the combination of working on one subject in an intense way, being close to other students in your course, being close to other students on the program, that really for many students is one of their most enjoyable experiences at university and a transformative experience, both because it's delightful, but also because they can, uh, uh, all of us who've taught the summer abroad programs will say that the amount of academic development that students can experience without really necessarily realizing quite how it's happened, because it's to do with the, the, the fact that they're around other students, many of them doing the same course, that they're working on one subject, that they're very close with the other students, but they're also uh, have lo close contact and are frequently seeing the professors teaching the course. Uh, I can promise you that you will all have an extraordinary educational experience as well as a wonderful visiting experience. And I do encourage any of you who can to apply and come and join us because you'll have a wonderful time. So, Karen, would you like me to just go on now to talk about my course? Yes, you could go ahead and talk about your course. Just as a just as a little piece of information, our criminal justice system in Canada really derived from the English uh, and wider British criminal justice system. And that began to develop in a recognizable form that looks something, beginnings of something like today's criminal justice system about a thousand years ago, which is also, by the way, when Oxford University was founded. And so we have a wonderful opportunity. And, and as you'll see, many of the other courses have similar opportunities. We have a wonderful opportunity in this course to be thinking about the history and the current uh, operation of criminal justice processes in both in the UK and England specifically and in Canada uh, and to see some of the problems, some of the solutions. And we can sort of trace that from the place where it all really started for us. And that is an extraordinary opportunity to make both the history of the process and the current issues come to life in, in a way that, uh, that's quite unusual. So we will be looking at this course on the history of the development of criminal justice processes and current practices, both in Canada and the UK. And we'll be looking specifically at some things that they do in the UK that we've either only briefly tried or haven't tried in Canada, but we'll also be looking at some developments in Canada that actually have been very influential in the UK. So we're able to sort of move back and forwards between Canada and the UK. And for this course, there'll be a number of assignments and there'll be classes. There'll also be very frequent office hours with me, and there'll also be fixed appointments to discuss a term paper you're going to write. Every student's going to do that. Uh, we'll also have guest speakers uh, come to talk to you about criminal justice matters. And we'll also have two field trips to London. The first field trip is a, is a sort of intended, it's very enjoyable, it's rather a long day, but it's it's really trying to take you from the earliest days of criminal justice up until uh, more recent, not the present, but uh, more recent developments, but doing it by visiting a number of places, interesting places in themselves that will allow us to draw out that history. And the last visit, the second visit is actually rather specific. It sounds a bit ghoulish, but it is, uh, we're going to visit sites that will allow us to trace the history of political violence, serious violence, riots and suppressions and so forth that have marked London's history uh, again for a thousand years. And let me just finish by saying that 
my aim in this course is not, even though it's a full credit course, it's not that you will go away with an incredibly encyclopedic knowledge of anything that you're reading a million pages while you're there and trying to learn huge amounts of information. That's not the purpose. The purpose is that you will go, what, what, whether you're a criminology student or not, you will go from understanding things at a certain level over the four weeks. I, I promise you that there will be some difficult, complex issues that face all criminal justice systems that you will have a deep understanding and thoughts about. And that will be reflected in the fact that you have a, an opportunity for your scholarly skills, your writing to improve through close contact with me in meetings and in the in the classes and in the visits, but also close contact with the other students that are doing the course. So it doesn't matter what level of writing you and research skills you currently have, you can be the outstanding academic writer for your age, or you can be someone who dreads essays because you, you don't think your English is great, or you just don't like writing essays. I promise you, by the end of it, you will be much more confident and you'll be able to do better in your academic work in all of your courses. Thanks very much, Professor Wasserman, for providing that information. I am going to ask Professor Nazim Khazra to speak about her course, Economics Course ECO 250, in Big Data Tools and Applied Machine Learning for Economists. This is the second year that this course will be offered at Oxford, and we're very fortunate and happy that we're going to be offering this again. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed teaching this course last summer, so uh, I'm back. So about this course, uh, it's hard to imagine this world without the AI anymore. Uh, I want to give you guys these tools. Uh, we are going to learn about a AI, machine learning, um, some data science tools in economics, which will allow you to broaden your job market and get high paying, interesting jobs in our disciplinary fields. The structure of the course will be just project based. So we're not going to have any quizzes, any exams, and you will work with the data set that I give you individually. You will define your own projects and you will write a full project during these four weeks. I will give you sample codes and uh, we will have office hours every day. There will be me and Professor Fahudi uh, teaching this course and uh, will be there for you to answer your questions every day. At the end of the month, you will have written paper that's solo authored by you and you, you can showcase this uh, on your CV, you can submit it to grad school, you can submit it to jobs, and it will shine on your resume, and especially since you have the name Oxford following that um, paper. In terms of field trips, uh, last year we went to uh, Google and Salesforce, and we had a, a scientific walk uh, in Cambridge. We're going to keep the uh, visits the same. The way it went last year was that we went to uh, Google campus, and they had full day talk scheduled for us, uh, students interacted with many of top managers at Google. They learned about how this interdisciplinary field works, what are the job opportunities, what they should do if they want a job at Google, for example, what skills they should have, how they get an interview, and so on. And it was a fantastic experience. And we also went to Salesforce. They taught us about their machine learning models, how they work in practice, how they manage data. And students uh, got to go up the tower and enjoy some cappuccinos. So that was very nice. And we hope to have a similar field trip this year. Um, one thing that I want to add, you can, you can find more on the syllabus, but one advantage of this one month intense program is that usually I have a TA's grading for me and um, I just go to class, teach, and the, the rest of the interaction is with the TAs. But in this course, uh, you have access to two professors every day, which is very rare. You give comments directly from us, not from the TA. So you get high quality comments. You can ask your questions directly from us and we'll work together as a team. And this is this is a very rare opportunity and a great experience. And, and uh, I can write you good recommendation letters because I know you and I know your work personally. And also it's Oxford. It's amazing. You have tea and scones and clotted cream. So that would be fantastic. Thanks, Professor Kazra. Moving along, we're going to go to English, ENG 296. I'm going to ask Professor Blake to speak more about her course. Hi, everyone. So my name is Professor Blake. Um, the title of my course, as you can see, is Margaret Cavendish, Renaissance Book History and Editing Women Writers. Uh, if you want more detail, I do have a sample syllabus that's been posted online, um, so you can get a lot more details there. I'm just going to speak more generally. I can also answer questions uh, in the Q&A within the 
this thing, or you can email me at liza.blake at utoronto.ca. So Margaret Cavendish, Duchess of Newcastle, uh, born Margaret Lucas, uh, lived in the middle of the 17th century. Queen Henrietta Maria uh, set in Merton College. Uh, Queen Henrietta Maria was in Oxford um, because her court fled there in the 1640s when the English Civil War was happening. When the court then moved to Paris, Margaret moved with her, um, and that's where she met William Cavendish. And then they lived uh, for most of her adult life in Antwerp in modern day Belgium, and then returned to England with the restoration of the crown in 1660. So in this course, we're actually going to be sort of following the major steps of her life. She starts in Oxford, she moves to Antwerp, she goes to London, and then she sort of retires in the English countryside in Welbeck near the end of her life. Um, and just to note that if you're a little nervous about going to Antwerp, um, English is actually one of the official languages in Belgium, so you should be comfortable even as a pure English speaker while you're traveling. Margaret Cavendish was a very prolific writer. Um, she wrote experimental poetry, even more experimental plays. Uh, essays. She wrote one of the first science fiction novels, so, um, you know, Suck It, H.G. Uh, Wells. Um, she wrote essays, she wrote science writing, biography, autobiography, um, and we're going to read a lot of different kinds of things that she wrote. So the goal of the class is to just sort of read more about this woman you may not know about because you just get force-fed Shakespeare all the time, um, but also to learn a little bit about book history and about editorial theory and practice. So in Antwerp, we're going to go to the Plant and Moretus printing press, which was one of the earliest printing presses in Europe um, and also one of the most important in the early modern period. And you're actually going to see the details of how early books got printed and how printing sort of arose in the Renaissance period. Um, I've also contacted rare book librarians in Oxford and Antwerp who've agreed to let you come and actually see some rare books in person, including in Antwerp copies of books that Cavendish herself wrote in and then donated to Antwerp libraries. Uh, book history as a field is interesting, not just because it lets you learn about the rise of printing and things still relevant for books today. So for example, when we talk about uppercase and lowercase letters, that's um, because of the placement of the cases of type in early modern printing houses, but also because we'll think about how the media in which something is printed um, or which something is presented changes how you read it. Um, the differences between reading something in an original rare book, a modern print edition, and an online edition, how that sort of changes your reading practices. So learning book history helps you learn how to close read the text, but also how to close read the material form through which those texts get mediated. We'll also talk in this class about the way that additions uh, mediate and affect your reading practices, um, and you'll learn to think really critically about editing both as a practice, um, but also how to perform those practices yourself. So you'll leave this class not only with the sort of basic knowledge of book history, but also with textual editing as a skill, um, something you can put on your resume. Um, and for the final project of the course, you can either write a more traditional paper or you can produce a mini edition of one of the Cavendish text Text we've read for the course. You'll have that option either way. Uh, some of the text we're going to read, just to highlight three of my favorites. Um, so we'll read Convent of Pleasure, which is a super queer and possibly trans play where a woman founds her own comment, convent, a women-only convent, um, based not on religious principles, but in order to let women just like sit and read and talk about philosophy with one another. We'll read Tale of a Traveler, whose main character um, cross-dresses and whose pronouns change uh, and get changed differently in different copies by Cavendish's own hand. And then we'll read A Blazing World, and I'll just end with a quick description of that because it's my absolute favorite. Um, so Blazing World is her science fiction novel. Um, it's set in an alternate universe where a young woman gets kidnapped by pirates. Um, they're on their way to the North Pole for whatever reasons pirates would want to go there where they all die because they're naughty. And then the boat drifts from the North Pole onto another planet that's connected at that pole. Um, there the woman meets animal men who take her to their human leader, the emperor. She marries the emperor and then the emperor disappears. So now she's just in charge of an entire planet. And then, you know, who needs him anymore? Now she has the power. Um, she says, sets up scientific societies on this new planet. She discusses the nature of nature. Um, and then one day she calls upon the immaterial spirits that are obviously hanging out on this planet and asks them to fetch her a scribe so she can sort of write everything that she knows. Um, she asks for air 
Aristotle and Descartes, um, the sort of really famous classical and contemporary philosophers, and the spirits say that men won't really want to be a scribe for a woman because they're jerks. Um, and they suggest instead that she call upon the spirit of Margaret Cavendish, Duchess of Newcastle, who's a smart lady from another dimension. And so at this point, the Duchess's soul joins the Empress. So now we have sort of two Mary Sues, two people in the story who represent Cavendish. The two of them talk about philosophy and politics, invent worlds in their mind, and then travel as souls back to the Duchess's planet, where they enter into her husband's body and have a platonic soul threesome. And then in part two of The Blazing World, and yes, that was only the first half, uh, the Empress learns her original country is under attack and sort of returns with an army. Um, so even if you came here to learn about criminology, I hope that has motivated you to read this incredible sci-fi novel. Um, and if you came here for English, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to teach you this uh, incredibly strange and interesting woman and also to learn some hopefully useful skills. Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Blake. Lastly, uh, we have psychology, PSY 306Y, taught by Professor Kamenetsky uh, on special topics in psychology abroad, disability, culture, and inclusion. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful session. If I could just follow up um, on a few things that, that were said. Um, first of all, as you could see, uh, Oxford is absolutely breathtaking. I'll, I'll never forget my first bus ride into um, Oxford. This will be actually the, the fifth time that I'm teaching in, in Oxford. It will be my eighth time teaching in, in the program. Oxford is absolutely beautiful, and, and it, it really keeps me coming back time after time. Um, the other thing to say about this being the eighth time be teaching the course, um, the summer abroad program tends to attract professors that really, really love teaching and really, really love students and really love this small group um, setting where we really have a wonderful opportunity to get to know students um, in these courses. We don't always have that opportunity, of course, at U of T. Many of us teach large classes, and really the Summer Abroad Program provides that wonderful opportunity for students get to get to know one another and students and profs to get to know one another. I could tell you that personally, from my own experience, I've had quite a few thesis students, fourth year thesis students who I met um, at a summer abroad course that, went, course that went on and did undergrad theses with me. Um, I've published papers with students that I met through these courses. Um, so it, it, it's really an, an outstanding and unusual opportunity um, because of you know the students that are attracted, but certainly because of the professors who are really, really interested in teaching. One thing I should also say is that many of us have assumed major roles or continue to assume major leadership roles in undergraduate programs at U of T, whether we're undergraduate program directors or responsible for um, academic appeals or academic integrity. Many of us are very much involved in undergraduate education at, at the University of Toronto. The course that I'll be teaching will be a, a psychology course. And we are going to, this course is going to focus on disability. And we're going to ask one so-called simple question throughout this entire course. Of course, it's not a simple question. Is disability an inevitable consequence of impairment? We will be discussing a lot, both the medical model and the social model that explains the, the disability experience. We'll be defining impairment. Impairment is medically, objectively uh, determined. Um, a broken body, a broken bone, an eye that doesn't work, and so on. And our question is going to be whether that impairment actually leads to the disability experience which can be the inability to, to work, the exclusion from society, and so on. And we're going to consider both the medical and social explanations for um, this, and we're going to see that in the end of the day, it's a contribution of many of these. And, and, and factors such as history, culture, and nationality uh, play a very, very important role in determining these, um, these explanations for this phenomena. Um, so we'll be really looking at this, but I can't say that this is a course, psychology course, this is very much of an interdisciplinary course. Uh, many such courses are offered by programs in the humanities, by disability stu studies programs in the humanities. This, because it's offered in psychology, which at UFT is an empirical science, is going to really try to balance the medical and the social explanations to provide a very, very broad type of idea as to what indeed is responsible for the disability experience. Um, in order to do that, um, in addition to lectures, we're going to have guest speakers who will come to class either in person um, or via Zoom. And of course, we're going to have uh, presentations and readings 
We are going to visit eight different places. Um, that will include three long trips to London as well as a walking trip um, in Oxford. Um, and let's go through these briefly. So the first trip is going to be an accessibility walk tour of the University of Oxford. Obviously, it's a very, very old university, as we heard from uh, Professor Watson, about a thousand years old. Many of the buildings over there are, are old, have many steps, are completely unfit um, in terms of accessibility, wheelchair accessibility, and so on. Yet today in the UK, as well as in Canada and most of the OECD world, the laws are such that guarantee a full inclusion and accessibility for all people with disabilities. And of course, that's a big contrast with historical places and preservation of the historical beauty of some of these places. We'll be taking a very interesting tour to see how that's managed at the University of Oxford. We will be visiting the Bethlehem Museum of the Mind. For the psychology students here, you may remember as far back as your Psych 100 uh, textbook, we talked about Bethlehem, one of the first psychiatric institutions or what used to be called insane asylums. Um, and that is located, of course, in London. And we're going to visit the site and we're going to learn about its history. We'll get to do some archival work over there where we'll look at actual patient records from 150 years ago and, and we'll learn a little bit about how psychiatry was pra practiced at the time. We'll be visiting the Foundling Museum. We are going to learn about um, institutionalization and hospitalization of children with disabilities. Children with disabilities used to go to hospitals. We didn't have the same type of distinc distinction that we have today between a hospital and an orphanage and a group home and a residential facility. And we're going to learn about that at the Foundling Museum. We are going to visit the London Science Museum. There are very interesting exhibitions over there about advancements um, in medicine. So whether we are talking about medical technology, whether we are talking about prosthetic devices such as prosthetic limbs, we're going to learn about how these have developed over the years at the London Science Museum. We are going to, this is a re relatively new site that we visited for the first time last year. We'll be visiting the Museum of Military Medicine, which is actually on an army base about an hour outside of um, London. Very, very fascinating place. We are going to learn that, of course, war is horrible with terrible consequences, but the truth is that wars have advanced medicine in very, very interesting and very, very important ways. Um, whether we're talking about the development of, of antibiotics, modern blood transfusions. I've actually learned that in the past, blood transfusions in, during war times were done by connecting one person's veins to another person's veins while they were both alive. We did not have the notion of having a blood bank with testing and all of the rest of that. So we're going to be visiting that, that location and we're going to learn how medicine has advanced over the years. And by it sometimes increasing the disability experience because many individuals that would have never survived wars ended up surviving wars and living with their disabilities for the rest of their lives. We'll be visiting the College of Optometrists Museum, the Eye Museum in, in London, and we're going to learn be learning over there about disability images. As we could see, if you look on the screen, many of us, most of us, wear eyeglasses. In many senses, wearing eyeglasses it is the most prominent sign of disability. We are basically, all of us are advertising to the world. We don't see very well. And we'll be looking at eyeglasses as images of of disability. And it's kind of a very interesting uh, conversation because eyeglasses have also been seen over the years as an image of being smart, of being intelligent, of being well, well educated. Um, it's also been an anti-Semitic image. Those are Jews are counting the money again. So it's a very, very interesting notion that really attracts a lot, a lot of attention for a particular relatively simple and ubiquitous a disability image that also has taken upon itself many, many other connotations, both positive and negative. We'll be visiting the Freud Museum. So of course, Freud lived in London um, for about eight or nine months during World War II. He was, was Jewish, managed to escape Austria, Vienna, where he lived, of course, uh, during World War II. And we'll get to see um, his house, the house where his daughter, um, Anna, also lived, Anna Freud, uh, who really was a major contributor, or some say that has developed child psychiatry. So it's, of course, a very, very interesting place to visit. Yes, we will see the Freudian uh, couch. They used to let people lie on a model of it. They don't allow that anymore. But I'll ask again this year. We'll see what happens. And we'll get to also visit uh, locations where infamous paper people work. So at University College London, we'll get to visit the Galton Collection. 
um, psych students. You may remember that Sir Francis Galton provided major, major developments to, to statistics. You may remember the concept of regression to the mean, wrote books and books and books about um, statistics, um, how to manage, how to understand data, and, and so on. We didn't learn in psychology as much about him also being the, the, the infamous founding father of eugenics. Of course, the eugenics movement was disastrous uh, towards people with disabilities and many, many, many undesirable others uh, by really looking at the, the sterilization and the murder of undesirable people, which of course included people of, of color and, and, and certainly people with disabilities. Uh, many people don't know that uh, the Holocaust in many senses started with the murder of a half a million people with disabilities in Germany and in Austria in the early 1930s in the T4 program. Um, so we'll, we'll also learn about the, the difficult history of disability in the, in the 20th century through that presentation. Um, and as you can see, in the end of the day, it's a, it's a happy place. I don't think it was mentioned, but in the last week, we have what we call a high table dinner where everybody, as you can see, gets dressed very, very nicely. And we have a beautiful, beautiful meal together. Um, and this is a, a, a picture of one such occasion that took place in 2017. So, so the students really, really, I could tell you from of all of these eight years, the students have really come together and enjoyed their time together and learned a lot from one another. Thanks very much, Professor Kamenetsky. Thank you very much, professors, for uh, sharing all the details about your courses. And just by listening, I could see like the, the variety of courses that we are offering in Oxford this year is just amazing. So 2024 will be the 22nd year that we're offering our on-site program in Oxford. This year, we're going to be offering it from Sunday, August August 4th to Saturday, August 31st. So exactly four weeks. As you know, we have five courses and this general structure of our courses is from Monday to Thursday from 8.45 a.m. to 12 p.m. So basically, this is just four lectures in principle. As all professors did mention, we do have mandatory field trips. So this does not include the field trips. Your field trips may occur on Monday and Thursday. They could occur Friday to Sunday as well. So this is just loosely in principle what our schedule is like. If you are admitted, please do not book anything until you actually know the confirmed schedule of your course. As I mentioned, all courses have mandatory field trips and will occur outside the class hours. Program activities. Um, we have city walking tours during that first day. We have a high table dinner during the last week, which is a formal dinner uh, that is hosted by Worcester College. Punting, which is uh, optional, which is almost like a gondola, but it's a flat bottom gondola uh, that you'll see throughout the campus. Pub and trivia night. We actually have a pub that's dedicated to our group and lots of karaoke as well. Our program is hosted by Worcester College at the University of Oxford. So it is structured like St. George and you'll be situated your classes as well as your accommodations will be at Worcester College. The purpose of our program is of course, it's mostly an academic program. It's not a vacation. As you know, you're gonna to be totally immersed into the subject matter, but your experience will be similar to that of the student from England. If you live in Toronto, it may be different from what you expect in Oxford, and that's the case of our summer abroad programs. We want to make sure that you are immersed in the local culture of any destination that you do choose to take. So as I mentioned, there's a college tour. We provide Oxford City walking tours as well as high table dinners. I mentioned there's punting down the Sherwood River, insider tours of Christ Church, which is optional. And um, optional activities could also be high tea as well. So as you can see here, this is a picture of last uh, year's high table dinner, which lots of students do say is one of the highlights of closing the program. In terms of Oxford, the accommodations, as I mentioned, in classrooms is at Worcester College. This is just a brief bird's eye view of Worcester College within the University of Oxford. It's a beautiful, beautiful site. Lots of green space. Um, there's a huge sports field. And our accommodations that are assigned to us are sort of scattered around this campus. Our classrooms are also located here as well, so everything is walking distance. Worcester College was founded in 1714 and the institution of learning on site since the late 13th century. It has 18th century buildings and medieval cottages, just beautiful. 26 acres of gardens, lakes, and large sports grounds. It's cl very close to the train station and bus stations. Um, literally, it's across the street. Very, very convenient if you do want to go to the center of London or any other sort of um, cities uh, that are accessible through trains and buses. And it's a short walk to the city center. So there's a new mall there. There's lots of um, shopping as well as cafes, um, restaurants. 
uh, places to go get your food as well. So um, a very lovely town and a really lovely college to be living in in four weeks. Accommodations. So more information is on our website. Accommodations. So if you do choose to stay at Worcester, is all single rooms with an ensuite washroom. So you do have uh, your own bedroom as well as your ensuite washroom. This is British style washroom, meaning that it maybe look a bit different than what you're used to in Toronto, but you do have your ensuite uh, bathroom. Um, you have internet access, so Wi-Fi access. And every day, if you do stay at Worcester, you have a daily hot breakfast, which is included. So at the top here, you have sort of like an idea of the kinds of foods that are served every day. We do ask that you budget about 700 Canadian dollars for other meals, such as lunch, snacks, as well as dinners, too. There are shared kitchen facilities for most of our accommodations as well. So if you want to make a sandwich, prepare your own meals, you could do that. There's a 24-hour porter's lodge, which is great. When you do enter uh, the college, you'll be seeing a porter and they're there 24 hours, uh, which is great in terms of security and having a contact if needed. Please know that this is England, so there's no air conditioning. Now, every year, I like to say it's cooler than it is in Toronto in the summer. There was one year, I believe in 2022, which was seasonably hot. But it's assured, uh, most of the summers are pretty cool. And just note that there's no air conditioning in your accommodations. A couple pictures that students have took in the past of accommodations. Fairly nice spaces as well as study spaces for you as well. Do you have your own bathroom? This is an example of a shared kitchen. And there is two or three laundry facilities as well that you could through card access for all of our student guests. If you want to know more information, um, we have lots of videos that are available on our website, such as final reflections, an actual tour uh, that was provided from our past participants. I highly encourage you to visit our website and to check out these videos that are made from students. You'll get a lot of sort of inside information and scoop from our students who have taken our programs in the past. And amenities at Worcester College, we have a junior common room, which is just a common room for all our students. Our on-site staff do like having hours there as well. So if you want to meet with them, that's great. Uh, we have card-operated laundry machines, a college pub, which is quite fun to have. So probably around two nights a week that's dedicated to our group. There's a gym uh, that's dedicated to the college as well, tennis courts and the basketball court, as well as I mentioned, a Porter's Lodge. So on-site staff, as I mentioned, these are non-academic staff and they're available to students during regular office hours. So um, you can meet with them if you have any problems, if you want to talk about anything uh, throughout your trip, that's what they're there for. They're there for emergency contact. If you need somebody to accompany you to the hospital, uh, for instance, or to a doctor, if you have any problems, that's where they're there for. They're also a first contact to our office and to U of T. There is support on site for you that is hired by our office and that live at Worcester throughout the duration of the program. They are also a liaison with Worcester College, the residents, faculty, and students to ensure the success of the programs. Our on-site staff, is, they are very important to the success of this program, and we're very fortunate to have on-site staff, very reliable on-site staff for many years that has helped us out for this program. Things to keep in mind, local customs and standards are different. Accommodations and manners, even though you think things may not be different between Oxford and Toronto, it still would be, and you just want to make sure that you uh, are aware of those differences as well. As I mentioned, the average temperature is about 18 degrees. I would like to say it's a bit warmer than that, but cooler typically in um, compared to Toronto weather. Expect some humidity and rain. You're in the UK, so it does rain quite a bit. And be prepared to be adventurous, independent, flexible, as well as adaptable as well. I forgot to mention that our, um, our accommodations at Worcester is single en suite. However, if you're admitted to the Cinema Studies course, as well as the English course, uh, there are overnight trips to Antwerp for English as well as Liverpool in for cinema studies. At that case, you'll be staying in hotels and you'll most likely be staying in double accommodations. So more information will be sent to you if you are admitted to these courses, but please keep that in mind as well. In terms of getting there, there's no group flight for this program. You are responsible for booking your own travel plans. However, our office will provide information on suggested recommended flight itineraries. So if you're flying from uh, Toronto, 
uh, we will let you know recommended flight, direct flight uh, that you could take. Um, there will also be travel uh, provided for students who do take the re recommended flight or who do arrive at Heathrow Airport at the same time as a recommended flight. Um, so there will be uh, buses that will be available to take uh, students from Heathrow to Worcester College. However, if you're traveling on your own, it's fairly straightforward to uh, take a bus or to travel from Heathrow Airport to Oxford, and we walk students through this process um, during the pre-departure orientation. Before you apply, uh, unfortunately COVID hasn't completely left us yet. We do ask students to please review the COVID-19 planning page from the Safety Abroad pages and to go through the travel checklist to guide you through important things you, to do before you travel. Stay up to date with your COVID-19 vaccination and review information on prevention and risks as provided by the government of Canada. Please review the FAQ section on our website as well in terms of COVID uh, announcements and uh, requirements. We're very um, happy to announce that we have a new section on our website on equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility resources. This may be your first time traveling to another country, and so so we, uh, and this could be, have an impact uh, on you to be immersed on different cultures away from home for the first time. And we want to uh, provide resources available to specific nine categories of student community. So you could see up the right page of this, right uh, column of this page, the types of resources that we do provide for students. Please visit this website. There's lots of resources there for you. And we want to make sure that you know that our office is committed to the principles of equity, diversity, inclusion, and our goal is to support all students, participants in your study abroad experience and to remove any kinds of barriers as possible. We also have an amazing um, uh, advisor that's dedicated to EDI related inquiries. If you do want to set up an appointment to meet with Jen Sue, please feel free to do so on our website. In addition to that, accessibility abroad, students who, are requ who require accommodations such as extra time to complete its assignments, adaptive technology, etc should register with their campus accessibility services offices so that an accommodation plan can be placed for this course. The earlier, the better. So letter of accommodation must be uploaded to the application within seven days after being admitted to a summer abroad program. Note that the range of accommodations may be differ from country to country, and we cannot guarantee that sites will be able to offer all the accommodations that are available at U of T. So the accommodations that are approved for you here at U of T may not necessarily be completely the same as for you at Oxford. Uh, please connect with our office um, if you do have any questions about that. You're encouraged to contact us as early as possible to discuss which sites best suit their needs so that we may provide the best possible student experience for you. So again, please connect with your accessibility service office to discuss more of your accommodation plans and please uh, set up an appointment or contact our office if you have any questions in regards to this. So now I want to ask Alicia to quickly chat about her past experience in Oxford, England in 2022. So hi everyone, my name is Alicia and I'm a summer abroad ambassador from Woodsworth College and I'm also a fourth year student working towards completing a double major in English and women, gender, and sexuality studies. I also want to note that the course code ENG296 remains the same each year, however the course content tends to differ. Um, so with that being said, in the summer of 2022, I traveled to England where I studied ENG 296, special topics in English literature, uh, specifically Shakespeare at Oxford University with Catherine Williams. Um, and as you can see from the screen, these are various pictures that were taken during my time abroad. I also want to note that the two reason, reasons I took this course was that it fits into my degree requirement of being an English major. And ever since high school, I was simply fascinated by Shakespeare. So this course allowed me to challenge my current understanding of Shakespeare while providing me with the opportunity to ask every question that I've ever wanted to know and so much more. One of my favorite memories from summer abroad is of course the field trips. We went to Shakespeare's birthplace and we were able to walk through his childhood home and see how Shakespeare lived um, as well as his family and this not only reminded me that Shakespeare is a great playwright but a person as well. I also want to emphasize that summer abroad courses are not a bird courses but I do think it's safe to say that the professors understand that for many of us this is your first time abroad for most students so it's a balance between 
play and work. And with that being said, they tend to be very accommodating. I remember there was one week before the final assignment was due. Professor Williams said, oh, yeah, don't worry about the Wi-Fi being out. Take an extra week. Take all the time you need to finish the assignment. So that was very helpful in that aspect as well. In addition to this being an extremely immersive experience, uh, studying abroad at Oxford University not only inspired me to apply for a master's degree in the UK as well. So, yeah, I would encourage all of you to participate in a summer abroad program because it will not only enrich your academic life, but your personal one as well. Uh, summer abroad is more than a month overseas or a full year credit. It's an opportunity that contributes to your journey of becoming, becoming better students and better people. So yeah, thank you everyone. And I will hand it back to you, Karen. So thank you so much, Alicia. Um, we really appreciate your time. This is all on our website, but this is just a snapshot of the cost of studying in Oxford, England. Um, there are two components that we do like to separate with explaining fees that are paid for uh, this program. The first component is fees paid to U of T. If you are interested to apply for this program, you have to pay a, an application fee of $205. There's a course fee as well. Um, this is a U of T course, so you have to pay U of T incidental fees. Um, depending on which course that you are admitted to, there are different field trip fees dedicated to each course. So that is also embedded into your invoice. And lastly, there's accommodation fees that are added to your invoice as well. So all of these line items are uh, paid to U of T and they are paid through our portal, our invoice portal through Summer Abroad. The second component of cost paid would be additional costs. And these costs will be dependent on how you choose pay it. In terms of airfare, the approximate cost is about $1,500 to set aside about $700 Canadian dollars for meals, as well as to budget for medical travel insurance, as well as miscellaneous expenses as well. So in terms of the total cost to budget for, we like for you to um, take to uh, consider the total of approximately $11,400 to $11,800 for domestic students. And for international students, it's a total of $12,500 to about $13,000 for international students as well. So this is all outlined on our website. Um, if you have any questions in regards to specific costs, please uh, email our office. So in terms of application process, applications are now open. The deadline to apply for this program, as well as most summer abroad programs, is February 1st at 5 o'clock p.m. Participants are selected based on a set of criteria. So this is not based on a first come, first serve. We assess our applications in two components. One of them is the academic suitability. So if the course that you're applying to does have prerequisites, we do check those prerequisites. We, we also take a look at your CGPA and your transcript, specifically your last 12 months of study. Another important component of our application process is the personal statements. We do ask you five uh, very basic, um, very general um, questions and in response, you know, how you're going to prepare for this program, how it suits into your academic suitability, how you wish to contribute to this course as well. So there are no perfect answers to these questions. This gives you more of an opportunity to let us know why you're interested in this course, why you're interested in this program. And it really does sort of set you apart into, you know, um, what in, um, in addition to your grades, why you want to take this program and how it's going to um, benefit you in the long run. So again, academic suitability and personal statements is what we look at when we do assess our applications. The last step is to pay for a 205 application fee. If you're not selected to your course or the program, you get a refunded uh, this 205 application fee. Please note there are separate applications and fees for each program. If you're interested in Oxford and South Africa, for instance, feel free to apply for those two programs, but you have to complete two separate applications as well as pay two separate application fees. Since England uh, do, does offer multiple courses, you could rank up to two courses within this application in, for England. So if you are interested in taking English as your first choice, but you also see yourself taking criminology as your second choice, please feel free to add criminology as your second choice. It's not mandatory, but you can do that as well. And students who are offered a summer abroad award and choose to withdraw from their program will not be refunded any portion of the application fee. So this is just a snapshot of what you look at. I'm sure lots of you um, have seen this already of what our application 
looks like through our portal. It's a very seamless process and you just have to go through the questions as well as all the sections in order for you to complete the application. So admission decisions, we're going to act fairly quickly for Oxford. We hope to send the decisions by mid to late February. So if you do submit an application, please feel, please check your inbox uh, regularly and check for any notifications from our office. Note that if you do apply for an award, you will know um, if you whether or not you did get an award during that same day as well. Please note that admissions for on-site summer abroad programs is conditional upon Government of Canada allowing travel outside of Canada. If you do receive an offer and you accept an offer, that's great news, uh, but you'll have to uh, confirm your participation by paying a non-refundable $1,000 deposit. Even if you do get an award from us, everybody still has to pay deposit, letting us know that you have confirmed your spot. If you decline an offer, you will not get your application fee back. Your remaining fees are due on April 17th, 2024. And just a few notes about financial aid. For those who are completing an award application, you will be considered for a summer abroad award. So we have various awards that our office administers, but we only have one summer abroad award application that is embedded in our program application. So if you're eligible to apply for a financial aid award, you could uh, do so through our award application through our portal. Funding is open to all domestic U of T students based on financial need and award amounts based on de demonstrated financial need and destination. Should you be selected for an award, the amount will be applied toward the cost of your program. So you'll see this reflected on your invoice. It'll be deducted through your program costs. Uh, please note that we have, we're very excited to have a new award dedicated to Summer Abroad Inclusion, Diversity, and Excellence Award. We are offering four at $5,000. If you do want to see testimonials from previous recipients, please take a look at our website. Um, but you will also be considered for this award if you do um, complete our application. In terms of criteria, you have to be a Canadian citizen, permanent resident, or a refugee. You have to be a current U of T undergraduate student and completed at least 4.0 U of T credits by last December 31st. Your CGPA has to be at least 2.25. Uh, please note that some awards require a higher minimum average. And you must have documented financial need. If you do receive OSAP, if you did receive any kind of student loans, any kind of provincial loans from a different province outside of Ontario, even a tax assessment, assessment through your parents from last uh, year, uh, any kind of evidence of financial need, this documentation has to be uploaded into our financial need, financial aid application. That is the award criteria. More information is located on our website. We also have uh, merit-based awards for domestic students. We have limited number of awards, but you uh, could apply for one as well. Know that this is a, a supplemental application. So after you submit your program application, you could apply for a merit-based award. Woodsworth College offers limited merit-based awards for all those participating in summer abroad. As we may receive more applications and funds, applicants will be assessed on the overall quality of your application. If granted, the value of awards will only cover a portion of your costs and will incur while participating in the summer abroad program. The criteria for merit awards are fairly similar. You have to be a U of T undergraduate student, complete at least 4.0 U of T credits by December 31st, and have a CGPA of at least 2.25. There is a written component to this application too. CGPA has to be at least 2.25, but because this is a merit award, rest assured, um, your, the higher your CGPA, the better would be as well. In terms of finances, start budgeting now. A final payments will be due on April 17th, 2024. Please check with the registrar's office, the Faculty of Arts and Science Department, possible other travel awards and bursaries. Though now is the time, being a U of T student, you may have to take the initiative to see any other travel awards that are available to you. But it's worth a shot and it's worth asking your registrar's office, Faculty of Arts and Science, your campus, UTSC, UTM, to see if there's any additional funding available. Since it's a U of T summer course, you are eligible for OSAP. However, please note that you cannot uh, defer funds uh, if you do receive OSAP, just because our deadlines are much earlier than a regular summer course. So please keep that in mind. The Center for International Experience does offer IE Plus awards. I really highly advise you to look into this. CIE has been very generous in terms of providing great awards to our students in the past. So please uh, look into these awards as well. And we have an updated how to finance your summer abroad video on our website. So 
Um, there's lots of other options available to you. Please take a look at this video that is available on our website. And the last thing about visas insurance, all students are responsible for arranging your own visa if necessary. Our offices are more than happy to help you out in terms of supporting documents, admission letters, visa supporting letters once you are admitted. For the UK, Canadian citizens require passport valid for six months beyond return date. International students must check with your home, embassy, and consulate for requirements. And again, we will provide you any kind of supporting documentation. But because of that, we do recommend that you apply in Toronto so we could provide more uh, support for you if needed. Review the terms and conditions of travel, health insurance, which is mandatory, as well as flight insurance and cancellation insurance as well. So in terms of our program deadline, you're here in January, you're attending program information sessions, videos, our past information sessions. And this week, we also have program information sessions available for our various various programs, so please check them out. As I mentioned several times, our deadline to apply is February 1st at 5 o'clock p.m. Please keep an eye at, in your email inboxes to look for any kind of um, notifications as well as any kind of an announcement. As I mentioned, one week after admission notification, a $1,000 deposit is required in order to confirm your spot. Between March and April, your remaining fees are due. And we also start hosting our program pre-departure orientations, where you will hear from your professors, you'll get to meet your classmates online, and you'll also get to know more specific information about your projects, field trips, safety requirements. Um, you'll be provided a SharePoint folder, an e-binder of so many resources that are available there for you. And of course, in August, that's when you take off to Oxford and begin your program. Uh, we do encourage you to follow U of T Abroad on Instagram. This is a way to also be kept up to date with any announcements and also to look back and live vicariously through our students and their um, experiences abroad um, last summer during their various programs. In terms of being in contact with us during this very important month of January, we also have a monthly e-newsletter called the Summary. You could subscribe through our website. Um, you'll be uh, kept up to uh, date of uh, recent news as well as announcements. You can book a virtual appointment through an advisor through the Summer Abroad program. Programs. Our summer abroad student ambassadors have created a Discord group. They do post drop-in sessions every Monday morning. The schedule is on our website. Please join Discord and chat with them if you want to um, know more information through a student's point of view. And lastly, we are very happy to chat with you. You could email us through our summer abroad email address, pay us a visit on the third floor of Woodward College, or phone us during our office hours. Okay, well, I guess this is it for our information session. I want to thank all the professors who uh, spent their time and really did an amazing, amazing job in terms of explaining their courses. Thank uh, the team, some of our team for uh, helping us out uh, through the back end, uh, answering all the questions. I also want to thank Alessia for sharing her experiences with the Summer Abroad program. Thank you very much. And hopefully we'll get to see most of you in Oxford this summer.